Hello. In today's part, we will be going over events. Now, obviously, you probably want to add more events than I show in this video, so make sure to pay attention closely to really understand how you can add your own events. I will be going over an invisible block, player spawn, and death block. Before we get into that, though, some of you suggested that I show how to tween the position of the part instead of it just teleporting, so I'll spend a little bit explaining how to do that. This part's optional if you still want it to teleport. But first, insert a C-frame value into block placer and name it, Destin C-frame. This makes it so that we can easily tween its value, because you cannot conventionally tween a variable using tween service. Then, create a variable for this value so it's easy to refer to. Also, create a variable that retrieves tween service. Now, let's tween the value of our Destin C-frame. This is very simple, we just use tween serve, create. The first argument is whatever object we're tweening, in our case, Destin C-frame. The second argument is the tween info, but for us we're only worried about the time. The last argument is the properties that we're changing of that object. In our case, we're only changing the value property. We're changing this to whatever we were going to set the part C-frame to at first. Make sure to actually play this tween by adding, play, at the end. Now, instead of setting the C-frame to that value, we're going to pivot to that value instead. Usually, it does the exact same thing that setting the C-frame does, but for those of you who want to use models as assets, this facilitates that a lot. I recommend you do it, even if you're not using models. Adjust the time to your liking. You can even set it to zero if you want the block to teleport, but I want a subtle yet effective tween, so I'm going to do 40 milliseconds. As you can see, it moves a lot more smoothly. However, there will be a problem. If the player places a block while the block is tweening to its position, the placed block might end up off-grid. We can fix this by saving an untweened destined C-frame variable. We will set this variable to the destined C-frame. Then, when we fire the place block remote event, we will send this untweened variable. As you can see, while we're moving around our cursor and placing the blocks, they're only placing on the grid. Now that we're done with that, a lot of you have also been asking me how to work with differently sized assets. I'm going to demonstrate this using a couch decoration. I'm going to make my hitbox 8x4x4. I'm going to navigate the toolbox for a good couch mesh part. Make sure to use a model with no scripts in it to avoid getting hacked. Which is the reason I don't use my main account for developing grimacing face. As a reminder, since I want this mesh part to be paintable, I'm going to give it the paintable tag we created, make sure it's unanchored, and create a weld constraint. I'm going to put the couch into the decorations folder in the assets folder in replicated storage. I'll also make an asset button for it, but I'll actually set the viewport later. As you can see, the different sized asset has two problems, its surface selection can act weirdly upon rotating it, and it's actually off-grid by two studs on one axis. Because of its off-grid position, it also acts weirdly when you're trying to place it off the base plate or another block. This is where Pivot to comes in and why I said to use it even if you're not using models. If you have a part bigger than the original size, which is 4 times 4 times 4 for me, you have to imagine that there's a 4 by 4 by 4 block within that. In my case, I'm going to imagine that the left side of this couch is a block. Once I do figure that out, I set the pivot offset position to what would be the center of that block. In my case, it's just two studs away from the real center. If you don't understand, basically just place the pivot offset position point where you want the cursor to move the part to. As you can see, although there's still an issue with the rotation and surface selection, the couch now properly places on grid. The surface selection issue was never a problem with pivoting, it's a problem with the size itself. This whole time, we never even had to worry about the X and Z components being different because they were always both 4. But now, with bigger parts, they can vary. In my case, the X is 8 and the Y is 4. We can really just use our resize layer module script on the block placer script. However, we're going to redo the whole script because I found a much more accurate way to resize the layer. It's a little more complicated though so pay close attention. First, let's set the world axis in a constant at the beginning of the script. Clear the whole function, and by the way, we no longer need the layer parameter so you can just delete that. We're going to need two property variables though, the part size and its C-frame. Now, we're just going to return a vector 3 with much info. This vector 3 will be our layer size. All three components are similar and the only difference is the world axis we use. Again, this is very complicated code so pay close attention and triple check this part when you're done. For the X component, we find the angle that the C-frame is facing for each axis, X, Y, Z, or right, up, look, using dot products. Find the absolute value of this product so that the vector 3 doesn't hold a negative component because the size of an object cannot be negative. Then, to find the weighted sum, multiply the angle by its corresponding size component, and then add all of those. I initially made a mistake in which I just used commas instead of plus symbols, but I'll eventually fix it in this recording. Now, just copy and paste this, replacing the world axis for each size component. And that's about it. Like I mentioned, we'll come back here to fix a mistake later. I'm sure you guys remember previously using this module script, but we actually haven't used it on the client side. Let's make sure to set the size of the layer to whatever returns from the module script by requiring it. 
The layer's orientation is already 0, 0, 0 so we don't have to worry about that. And remember that we no longer use the layer as an argument, so you can just delete that from the server script. Again, I made a mistake on the module script, so I'll just skip to the part where I fix it. Make sure to replace the first two commas of each component with a plus sign, and you should be good to go. As you can see, it works great. However, you might notice that when we actually place the block, it's offsetting a little bit. This is because we send the pivoted position from the client side but we don't actually pivot it on the server side. This is a super simple fix. Instead of setting the C-frame to the position parameter, call pivot2 and use that parameter. And voila! It now works without any weird offset placing issue. Setting that pivot offset position is very important and your whole part can be off-grid if you forget to do that or do it incorrectly. One last thing I want to focus on before we actually move on to the events is how to make a part non-scalable. This can be useful for decorations if you don't want the player to have the option of scaling them. Select all the parts that you don't want to be scalable, and give it a tag with the name, non-scalable, like I did on the screen. If you want a block to have some sides scalable but others not, you could create an attribute or values or something for that. I might show how to do that later on in the series, but for now, I kind of want to give you guys a little challenge to test your scripting knowledge, and I wasn't thinking about that when recording this. But anyways, in the button 1up function, check if the block is non-scalable and the tool being used is the scale tool. If so, set the faces property of the handles empty. Otherwise, set the faces property to all 6 faces. We can do that by just unpacking the enum library for surfaces. Perfect. The scale tool only works if the block does not have the non-scalable. If it does, the handles will not show up. Like I said, to have only some faces show up, you can play with the faces property a little more. I'm going to speed up the process of setting up the couch decoration viewport. Okay, now on to the actual events. First, create a new button in your asset category frame. You may need to configure your frame size of grid layout size a little bit to make them fit properly. That button, of course, will be named events. Now, go to the assets frame and duplicate the scrolling frame and name it events. Then, create a folder in the assets folder in replicated storage named events. Once you're done with that, create a new server script in server script service named something like event handler. The first event I will be making is the invisible block. I'm using this to show how to make decals invisible when the game starts and visible when it stops. One of my friends actually gave me the official decal for the event corner design. I'll probably put a link in the description. If it's a scalable block, then use textures instead of decals so that the image won't just stretch and instead it will act as a tile type image. Make sure to put it on all six faces. For each texture, set the studs per tile U and V to however large the block size should be. In my case, this is 4. Once you're done with making your block, remember to put it into the events folder in replicated storage. Now, open the event handler script and let's get down to business. First, let's just start with a simple function that turns the descendants of any part transparent and non-collidable, whether it's a physical part or a decal. Our only parameter is the block that we want to do this to. We'll add variables as we go. The first one will retrieve replicated storage. Using that variable, let's refer to the original asset in the assets folder. This asset can be used for reference to decide how transparent to make the block. Use find first child with the recursive argument true so it will search through all descendants and not just direct children. Add a bool value into our values folder in replicated storage named playing. Make sure that the value is set to false or unchecked. Now, create a variable for this value so it's easy to access. Using this, set the block's transparency to 1 if the playing value is true, or the asset's transparency otherwise. Optionally, you can specify that the asset is a base part. Create a for loop that iterates through each of the block's descendants. For the reference, again, use find first child on the asset using the descendant's name, with the recursive boolean set to true. Check if the descendant is a decal or a base part. You may be wondering, what about textures? Well, actually, textures are under the decal class so they are included in this conditional statement. Inside this statement, set the descendant's transparency to 1 or its reference, depending on the value. Also, one thing I want to mention is that if you're using models, then delete line 6, which sets the block's transparency, because it will fire an error since you can't set the transparency of a model. Now we'll detect when the playing value changes and we are given the value as a parameter. Iterate through all of the blocks and call the make transparent function on them. I made a huge mistake that I didn't realize until editing this part of the video, this applies for all parts, even basic blocks. This means that any block in the game will disappear when you press play. Don't worry though, I recorded how to fix that and I will display that at the end of this video. But wait! A lot of you guys noticed a bug with my last tutorial. When you die, the script no longer works. This is because I moved the extras folder to inside the starter GUI, but that makes it reset every time the character is loaded. Simple fix. Create a new screen GUI and name it, anti-reset. Make sure to click off the reset on spawn property. 
Now, put the extras folder into anti-reset. We must adjust the code to fit this new hierarchy though. For the extras variable, add colon wait for child anti-reset after player dot player GUI and before colon wait for child extras. Now, using anti-reset, we can also create a start slash stop game button that doesn't disappear when the rest of the build GUI does. Create a text button inside of anti-reset and adjust it to your liking. The only thing that matters is that you name it, start game. Go to build local and set a variable for our newly created start game button. Now, create a boolean attribute for this button named in-game. Make sure it's set to false and is unchecked. Set a new value variable to the opposite of the in-game attribute. Set in-game to that new value and set text depending on that value. Basically, the first text should say something along the lines of, stop game, while the second should be, play. As you can see, while it doesn't necessarily do anything yet, it does toggle the text properly. Now let's actually make it do something. Create a new folder in the remote events folder in replicated storage. Name that folder other events and create a remote event in it named toggle game. In build local, upon pressing the test button, we'll fire this remote event and pass on the new value variable as a boolean. Now, on event handler, we'll receive this and actually change the playing value to whatever boolean was passed along. Also, make sure to enable or disable the build GUI depending on the opposite of the value. Now, when you press play, the build tools will disappear, but if you press stop, they will reappear. Don't forget to create the viewport asset buttons for the events frame. I will work on the invisible block one really quick. Go to events handler and add a conditional statement in the for loop and make transparent that makes sure the descendant is not the layer of a block. Also, wherever it says test value, replace that with test value dot value. As you can see, everything's working perfectly but the placing part still follows our mouse. Let's go to the function that runs when start game is pressed and make sure to set the tool value to zero. Perfect. Now that we're finished with the invisible block, let's move on to the player spawn. This part only allows for creative liberties for color, size, and decals. You must follow the name, hierarchy, and setup exactly though. First things first, name the part, player spawn. Then, add a spawn location into that part and customize it however you want but make sure that it's welded to the player spawn. Set the force field property of the spawn location to zero and name it, spawn. Also set the enable property to false. Now, add a spawn location into the workspace directly. This will be the default build spawn. Again, customize it however you want to but set the force field property to zero and make sure that the enable property is true. Remember to put player spawn into the events folder in replicated storage and let's script it. Go to event handler. We're going to check if there is a player spawn. If there is, then we will disable the build spawn and enable the player spawn. We also want to load everybody's character so that every player spawns where the player spawn is. And of course, make the viewport frame for this player spawn. Perfect. As you can see, when the game starts, I teleport to the player spawn. And when it stops, I teleport to the build spawn. Now that we're done with that, let's move on to our last event for today, the death block. Basically, if you touch this block while the game is running, you will die. Simple, right? But how do we make it safe while the game is not running and only kill people if it is running? Do we put a conditional statement inside the function? While that may seem like an ideal solution at first, this could get super redundant when you start adding more events into your game. But anyways, I chose the death block because I wanted to show three types of events in this video, a block that toggles decals to showcase the playing value, the player spawn, and a block that changes behavior when the playing value changes. The death block is the third one. I customized it and made a viewport for it. By the way, this is the part of the series where you have to start creating on your own. I'm of course not going to go through every single event in the game. Next episode will be on more complicated events with settings and stuff like that. But anyways, go to event handler and create a variable named connections. This will be a table that holds any functions that run based on the placing value. The reason we need this table is so that we can later disconnect or stop detecting these functions when the placing value turns false. Now, under the if bool statement, we will actually handle the behavior of the blocks. Create a nested if statement that will check the name of the block. In our case, if block.name equals equals death block. For this part, make an LCF statement for every event block in the game. For the death block, we're going to insert our first connection to the table. This connection will be detecting if the block is touched. Also, to make things easier, you can specify that the block we're using is a base part. We're given the part that was touched, so let's detect that it was part of a character by checking if the part's parent contains a humanoid. If the humanoid exists, we will set the death to zero. This is where things start getting niche because setting the health to zero is specific to the death block. Now, iterate through all of the connections in our table and disconnect them. It would be wise to check if the connection actually exists before you disconnect it, though, so wrap it in a conditional statement. As you can see, when the game hasn't started yet, the death block does not kill you. However, when the game does start, it does kill you. And then again, once the game ends, it doesn't kill you. 
However, when the game starts, if there's a placing block, it doesn't disappear. To fix this, go to block placer. Create a variable for the placing value. We will work with this in a little bit, but first go to build local and delete the line that sets the tool value. Now, at the bottom of block placer, detect when the placing value changes. We will set the tool value here. And before that, we will check if there's a placing block and delete it if so. Also call the reset accessories function. Here we go, the placing part deletes and if there were any handles or selection boxes, they are also gone. That's it for this recording, but there were a couple of things I forgot about so I'll transition to the next recording. So, there's actually still a problem that I mentioned earlier in this video. When we press play, basic blocks and decorations will also go transparent. This is obviously a problem, so we need a way to distinguish events from non-events. Can you think of a way to distinguish them? That's right. We can check if the events folder has a child named whatever the block is. Put everything that's in the loop into a conditional statement that checks if the block's name is found within the events folder in replicated storage. Perfect. The next change isn't necessarily an error fix, but it's good practice. Once we finish disconnecting all the connections in the table in events handler, we should also clear the table just to clean things up a little bit and not hold a bunch of nil values in that table. Anyways, that's about it for today. I hope you guys are looking forward to the next part of this series which will be more on advanced events that have settings and different physical behaviors. Also, I'm sorry that I'm posting so infrequently, school is finishing up and I've been studying much lately. But I hope you enjoyed this video, if you benefited from this watch, I would heavily appreciate if you could subscribe or like this video. It would mean a lot to me, but then again, just watching my videos is already huge support. Anyways, see you in the next video. Bye.